I'm a mild-mannered chiropractor these days, <laughs> but I was once the world's strongest woman. I began weightlifting in 1978 at 22. Within months, I clean and jerked more than any man in my weight class at a state championship tryouts, 165 pounds. But I could not, I could not advance to the finals. Women were not allowed. Try a girl sport, they said. Sorry, I don't do frilly. <laughs> so I entered men's competitions. In 1980, the US Weightlifting Federation's board split on holding the first women's nationals. Half feared degrading the sport. Half pointed to what I and others accomplished in men's meets. The president broke the tie in our favor. I won at the first four nationals with lifts of 177, then 187, then 209, then 253 pounds. I was accelerating. <laughs> But at one of those meets, a coach disparaged female weightlifters because we hadn't beaten a circus performer's 286 pound record from 1911. She was okay with Frilly. <laughs> <laughs> so that became my mission. In 1984, I invited the Guinness Book of World Records to watch me lift 289 pounds. The picture was too boring for the book, so we staged this one. <laughs> The next year, I became the first woman in the world to clean and jerk more than 300 pounds. <laughs> I was paving the way in uncharted territory. Let's put that weight in perspective. <laughs> it took two more years to get the International Weightlifting Federation to hold the first women's world championships. The Chinese dominated the event. As I warmed up for the final session, the US weightlifting director whispered some encouragement. You're our only chance for gold. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> it came down to my last clean and jerk, 275 pounds. The arena is silent. This is weightlifting. It's just you and the barbell. I'd worked for years to find that zone of total focus. I squat to grab the bar. My brain releases a flood of calcium ions to trigger every muscle into a massive coordinated contraction. I clean it and stand up. A knee dip, then boom. Leg split, drop under the bar, now stick it. The next muscles to fire were in my face, a smile. <laughs> <laughs> the, crowd, the crowd roared. They declared me the planet's strongest woman. I won five gold medals and five world championships. Women's weightlifting won Olympic in 2000. I'm now over three decades and about of breast cancer older. My max is now 147. Pounds. <laughs> I'm decelerating. And that takes me to what I want to talk about, deceleration. I'm proud of my role for the fight for equality for women in sports. Others did more. Eleven years before I joined the fray, Kathy Switzer refused to yield when a Boston Marathon official demanded that she, quote, get the hell out of my race. Activist Bernice Sandler persuaded Congress to pass Title IX in 1972, mandating equality for women in education, including athletics. The next year, after Bobby Riggs stated that female tennis players were inherently inferior, Billie Jean King decisively proved him wrong in straight sets in the battle of the sexes. All that, <laughs> all this made it possible for Monet Davis to grace the cover of Sports Illustrated last year for throwing fastballs, not for doing this. But progress has stalled. 
enforcement of Title IX is lax. Girls jumped from 7% of all high school athletes in 1971 to 30% in 1980, but have flatlined since 1996. Enforcement of Title IX is lax. More than three out of four schools are not in compliance. Head coaches of women's teams make less than half their counterparts. At top colleges, me median men's budgets are 2.5 times the women's. Before Title IX, most female, coaches, most female um, teams had female coaches. Today, two and five do. And don't tell me it has to be this way because men's football and basketball programs generate so much money. The vast majority of them run deficits. Professional sports are abysmal on gender equality. Male golfers share $256 million in prize money. The ladies get five times less. A double, uh, an NBA player averages $4.4 million. A WNBA player averages $72,000. Endorsements are worse. In 2013, female athletes got less than 0.5% of the sponsorship money. 2% of the TV airtime for female athletes <laughs> in a recent, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, female athletes got less than 2% of the TV airtime in a recent study, down from 6% five years before. Half the newspaper articles on female athletes at the 2012 Olympics contain sexist references. Is that because men hold 85% of the sports journalism jobs? <laughs> Over the past five years, 5% 5 of the covers of Sports Illustrated featured women, down from 9% two decades before and from 13% from the 50s and 60s. And that includes these covers. That's deceleration and degradation. It doesn't have to be this way. All four Grand Slam tennis events now offer equal prize money for women and men combined. And then there's CrossFit, my current passion. It's a crazy new sport that combines weightlifting and gymnastics and calisthenics and endurance into high intensity workouts. When the world's fittest women and men compete at the CrossFit Games, they equally share the ESPN news time and the $2 million purse. By the way, in 2011, I placed six in my age group. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm competing again this year. So far, I'm ahead of 95% of my rivals. Some strong and angry women in my generation brought down some very big barriers for women in sports. We fought for it. Today's women are complacent, more entitled than insistent. That's why we've stopped accelerating. We're stronger than ever. We need to get angry again. We need to fight again. The Women's Sports Foundation in a report, reported on the benefits of exercise for women. The title sums up why it's so important. <laughs> 